Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Susan L., Vice President and Executive Director of the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. Welcome to all of you here in person, and welcome to all of you who are joining us online for our annual Leading Edge Nursing presentation. It's going to be a wonderful evening. Because of our generous donors, the Foundation is proud to support both current and future nurses, and we have some matriculating students here with us tonight as well, uh, with our partners. Uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital and Barnes Jewish College, Goldfarb School of Nursing, through our mission of enriching lives, saving lives, and transforming health care. Your gifts fund continuing education for nurses who are expanding their expertise in a range of areas, from transplant to anesthesiology to, well, many, many areas. You're also opening doors for bright, enthusiastic students who can pursue nursing thanks to life-changing scholarships. So to all of you here tonight who make this possible, we offer a heartfelt thank you. thank you. If you've ever been a patient, you know that nurses are at the very heart of health care. They work hard every day to provide the most extraordinary care possible, both inside and outside the hospital walls. Nurses are also driving change more than ever before. One of the many areas where they are making a significant difference is in anesthesiology. The surgeries we all depend on, whether it's a routine surgery, a gallbladder surgery, a knee replacement, or a highly complex transplant or heart surgery, they're only possible with the expert skills and the focus of anesthesiologists and certified registered nurse anesthetists, also known as CRNAs. Tonight, we get to go behind the scenes into the fascinating world of anesthesiology and the important role that nurses play in this field. And we're going to hear from pioneering Washington University School of Medicine leaders in anesthesiology who are practicing at Barnes Jewish Hospital and teaching the next generation of nurse anesthetists. To start our presentation, We'll welcome Dr. Angela Clark, the Maxine Clark and Bob Fox President of Barnes Jewish College, Goldfarb School of Nursing. And following the presentation and Q&A, stay tuned because Dr. Angeline Peters-Lewis, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Barnes Jewish Hospital, will conclude the program. So now join me in welcoming Dr. Angela Clark. Angie. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to see you, and just a big thank you to the Foundation for everything that you've done and continue to do to support our community and, of course, our students. I am thrilled to be here tonight and to have the honor to introduce Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Avedon. Their depth of knowledge and their reputations in anesthesia not only elevate our college, but have led to transformational research and educational advancements, including Washington University School of Medicine's Department of Anesthesiology's number three ranking in NIH funding, and the CRNA program at Barnes Jewish College Nursing School ranking among the top 20 in the country. This outstanding reputation is a direct result of our program's affiliation with Washington University and, of course, Barnes Jewish Hospital and Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Avedon's leadership. Our CNA program ranking is just one more reason why Barnes Jewish College is considered the gateway to great nursing. Currently, there is a high demand for CRNAs due to the shortage of both anesthesiologists and CRNAs around the country. As a top teaching hospital, Barnes Jewish has a long, impressive history as a hub for nurse anesthetists. In 1929, Helen Lamb Powell became the founder and director of the former Barnes School of Anesthesia, one of just a handful of nurse anesthesia schools in the country at the time. Helen was the head nurse anesthetist at Barnes Jewish when Dr. Everts Graham made history in 1933 as the first surgeon to remove an entire lung. This was a significant milestone in modern surgery and was possible only because of advances in anesthesiology. The legacy of nursing leadership in anesthesiology continues. With us here tonight is Sugi Watanabe. If you'll go ahead and stand up.
Sugi had an incredible 37-year career in cardiothoracic specialties as a CRNA. She's worked at Jewish Hospital, Barnes Jewish Hospital, and later Washington University. Sugi remains an active supporter of our students and our program, and together with Dr. Hendricks, has an endowed scholarship. So thank you, thank you for everything you continue to do in your legacy. Today, Dr. Hendricks is the director of our nurse anesthesia program at the college. She's also a director of education at Washington University School of Medicine in the department. Like Helen Powell, like Sugi Watanabe, Dr. Hendricks is a pioneer. With a dedication to excellence in education and training nurse anesthetists, Dr. Hendricks was instrumental in establishing our CRNA program in 2004 and has built it into the premier program in the country. Dr. Hendricks also wrote the first CRNA textbook. Recently, Dr. Hendricks took her career to new heights and made history in 2022. She was promoted to full professor in the Department of Medicine at Washington University. This makes her the first nurse faculty be, to be promoted to full professor. <laughs> and just in, next month, Dr. Hendricks will be inducted into the American Academy of Nursery, Nursing as a fellow. This is an honor that's reserved for the most accomplished leaders in nursing policy, research, administration, practice, and academia, and we look forward to welcoming you. Dr. Avedon is the Dr. Seymour and Rose T. Brown Professor of Anesthesiology and Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at Washington University School of Medicine. He is a renowned investigator in the field of prevention of intraoperative awareness and explicit recall of surgical events, surgery and anesthesia and postoperative neurological outcomes, patient risk factors and postoperative outcomes. He has had an international impact on the field of anesthesiology and published in prominent scientific journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Science, British Journal of Anesthesia, Anesthesiology, Proceedings of the Academy of Sciences, and the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. We are tremendously grateful for your partnership, Dr. Avedon, and your support has empowered nurses to the fullest extent of our licenses. You remain committed to supporting our relationship between anesthesia residents and CRNA students, and this has created a very powerful and vibrant learning culture. I'm getting that. Dr. Hendricks and Dr. Avedon, Avedon together are true trailblazers, and we're so fortunate to have them with us here tonight to help us to understand better where we're at, where we're headed, and after the presentation, please know that there'll be time for you to ask questions. So please take a moment and welcome Dr. Bernadette Hendricks and Dr. Michael Avedon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for that amazing introduction. So um, as this shows, Michael and I are going to talk about um, anesthesia. And so our agenda is, I will first start out with the history of anesthesia, and uh, specifically the history of anesthesia at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, I'll also talk about the important advances that we've made from uh, the original days. And then Michael will, will take over and talk about what general anesthesia is, um, intraop awareness and post-op delirium, and then bring us to the realm where um, the WashU Anesthesia Department is on cutting edge, and he will talk about that with the use of telemedicine and innovative technology. And then we'll open up with questions and answers. So just going back to the history of anesthesia, if you think about you know, these old days when somebody would need anesthesia, what they did was the surgeon would try to work very fast while maybe they found some morphine to give to the patient, or they would give the patient alcohol, get them drunk, and then operate on the anesthesia. So, so that was very ancient, but that's how they got through. And like I said, the surgeons would work very quick to try to get through the procedure. Um, and then um, over time, we started developing new anesthetic uh, techniques. So um, there, there's, there's talk about how ether was developed, how chloroform was developed. Um, these are inhaled anesthetics. Nitrous oxide was developed. And so what the surgeon did then, and he also realized 
he would oftentimes operate in his office or he would operate at the person's home. And he realized then that in order to prevent surgical site infections, he should do it in a sterile environment. So he started bringing these patients to the hospital to do his surgery, or her. I, I'm saying he, but it could be he or her. Um, and so um, they started operating in the operating rooms, and he needed somebody to give the anesthetic. He knew that ether was out there. He knew that nitrous oxide was out there. Um, and so he would maybe have his partner give the anesthesia, and he would guide them through it, or a medical student, or somebody that was spending time with him learning learning the surgery role. And so, so it was a mixture of who would do the anesthesia. And they, I, I was reading about the history of the anesthesia, and they said sometimes the med student would be distracted because he would be more enticed about what the surgeon was operating on, and he would forget about the anesthetic that he was giving. So the, the surgeons decided, you know what, we need somebody trained in anesthesia. And so um, they started recruiting some of the best nurses to do this, and, and anesthesiologists. So they started training them and saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna train you to give this anesthesia. And so Dr. Everett Grams, like she said, came to Barnes Jewish Hospital, and he hired Helen Lamb as his personal anesthetist to give anesthesia. So she gave anesthesia for every single one of his cases. So at the same time, there were other hospitals starting this. So Sister Mary Bernard, um, we think is the earliest recorded nurse anesthetist. She was from Wichita, Kansas, um, and she practiced in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, so. Uh, this, this spread to other hospitals. Other surgeons were saying, hey, we w I want my own personal anesthetist also. And so um, they were training nurses to do this. Um, so they initially, when they, they knew, so ether was actually used for parties. They would party with ether. And then they realized, hey, this might be good for anesthesia because it takes away your pain. And so they started using it in the, in the operating room. So what they did was, here's a picture, they would take a gauze, piece of gauze and put it between two wires, and they would drip ether on it. So that's where the open drop ether method came about. There, were, there was one um, anesthesiologist who would just pour the ether on the gauze, and so he couldn't really say he was using the open drop ether method because it was actually saturated. Um, but they would have to watch so that the patient wouldn't breathe too much ether, so they would pull the mask away at times. They would put it back on closer when the patient was getting light. And that's how they judged how much anesthesia to give. Um, so, uh, like I said, this is a picture of a, an ether mask that was used. So, this is a picture of a CRNA administering anesthesia in 1918. We, we actually started giving anesthesia in the, during the Civil War period in the 1800s, and Agatha Hutchins went over to France and with Dr. Kreil, who was um, a surgeon who, who went over there, and he took Agatha Hutchins with him, who was a nurse, and they gave anesthesia, and she started training people in France, too, how to give anesthesia. People would say, I wanna learn how to do this, so it was, Med students, anesthesiologists, CRNAs, they weren't certified at the time, but nurses, she was training them on the spot. Um, and so, like I said, this is an old picture. So again, during World War I, Dr. George Kreil from Lakeside Hospital, which is now Case Western Reserve, trained nurse anesthetist Agatha Hodgins how to administer, and she used a nitrous oxide slash oxygen technique. And so I think all of us are familiar with that. If you go to the dentist, sometimes they give nitrous oxide, they call it laughing gas. Um, and so they were using that. Um, it's odorless, it's non-flammable. Um, so Hodgkins perfected this technique and she began to train other nurses and physicians. So they traveled uh, to Lakeside Hospital for training. Um, and so Helen Lamb, just going back to Helen Lamb, who is our his, um, CRNA from Barnes Hospital. Uh, she was born in, in 1899 in Butler, Missouri. She became licensed as a registered nurse in 1921. Um, she started practicing as a nurse at Christian Church Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. 
And then she, it said in the book, she traveled to Barnes to learn how to be an OR nurse. She was, um, so she spent like six months training at Barnes Hospital on OR nursing. And then she heard about anesthesia, so she traveled to Lakeside Hospital and got trained by Agatha Hodgson's on how to give anesthesia. And so, um, so again, she was, then she was working up there and, until 1927 when Dr. Everett Grams um, came to Barnes Hospital and he tried to recruit her. He, he realized she was trained well with Agatha Hodgson's and he tried to recruit her and first she said no. And then finally she came um, in 1927, she started giving anesthesia for every one of his cases. And, and then the other surgeons started getting um, jealous and saying, well, we want our own personal anesthetist. And so Agatha started training, I mean, Helen Lamb started training other nurses to give anesthesia. And so it, it, she started with one student at a time and she would train them. They would then work as a nurse anesthetist. And so in 1929, she officially started the nurse anesthesia program at Barnes Hospital. And again, she was um, Dr. Graham's personal anesthetist. She was also chief uh, um, of, of the anesthesia. So, um, so she started the school, and then um, I'm gonna come back to this, but I just wanna mention that in 1950, the School of Medicine hired an anesthesiologist, Dr. Douglas Eastwood, to head the nurse residence, the, the new residency program in anesthesia and take over as the head of, of anesthesia at Barnes Hospital. So he's, he, the School of Medicine brought him, he actually was the, the chief of anesthesia for Barnes Jewish Hospital, and later this switched to Washington University School of Medicine. Um, but just going back a little bit to, um, to Helen Lamb, I just want to tell you more about her, because it's exciting. Um, she is the one who started the program at Barnes Jewish Hospital. I have a canvas of her in my office. Um, she was a legacy. So she started one of the first schools of anesthesia, nurse anesthesia in the country. Initially, it started out at four months, and then she was very active in the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and she kept pushing and saying, we need to formalize our training. We need to make it more formal. And the program grew to eight months, and then in 1953, it it grew to 12 months, and then it went to 18 months. Um, in 1994, I graduated from this program, and it was two years at the time, and it was a certificate. And so now it has, it has grown even more, and nurse anesthetists are all ICU nurses who have worked in the ICU for several years. They go back to graduate school to get their CRNA training. It's a three-year program. They, they then get a doctorate of nurse practice or a doctorate of nurse anesthesia practice um, and, um, and it's a three-year program so it has it has grown but a lot of that is dedicated to Helen Lamb and some of the others in our profession who realized it should be a formal training so um, again the graduates were in demand Helen Lamb was excellent um, she had very good skills um, and so I, I have a, a big binder in my office of all of her students since 1929. So um, just a couple weeks ago, I got, I got in, um, somebody from that graduated years and years ago, they wanted verification that she graduated from the program. So I can look it up and look up the name and say, yes, she graduated from this program. Um, but these were some of the first students that graduated from the program. and. Um, like Dr. Clark mentioned, she, she was the anesthetist who gave anesthesia for the first total pneumonectomy that was done in the world. Um, Dr. Graham had a friend who uh, needed uh, what he thought was a tumor removed from his lung. When Dr. Gra Graham started operating, he realized that the cancer was much more involved and he removed the whole lung. And so this was the first total pneumonectomy that was done in the world. It was done at Barnes. And if you look at the anesthesia record, I found this in um, the archives at Becker Library, and Helen Lamb signed it. And, and she talks about what we would call now jet ventilation. She said, I had to give little tiny breaths of, of 
respirations very quick. And, and we do that sometimes in anesthesia. And so um, it's amazing to think back and, and think that you know, she did it manually uh, on her own with the ambu. It's like an ambu bag, but it's a breathing machine. Um, so her legacy, she helped establish the National Association of Nurse Anesthetists in 1931. Um, and she helped push for a formal curriculum for training. She set up the minimum educational standards for CRNAs, and she also helped form state associations. She helped found the Missouri Association of Nurse Anesthetists in 1935, and she served as its first president. She also served as president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. It says here, National Association of Nurse Anesthetists, but it was later changed to the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Um, and she was president from 1940 to 42. Um, I, I have an old hist history book, and it talks about all the committees that the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists had, and she was very active in the profession for years and years and years, trying to push this formal curriculum. So she was well-versed well in pharmacology and physiology um, and how it relates to anesthesia. Uh, and um, she also, the endotracheal tube got established in her time, and she was one of the few nurse anesthetists who used endotracheal tube anesthesia. So if you're put to sleep for anesthesia, um, most likely the, the anesthesia provider will put in an endotracheal tube because um, we can then ventilate you with oxygen and with inhaled gases, keep you asleep, and um, give you a, a very safe anesthetic. But it, there was rumors that she wouldn't let her students do endotracheal anesthesia until they became very skilled. And their last few months of training is when they were allowed to, to learn how to use an endotracheal tube. And it seems funny now because we use it routinely every day in the operating room. So she, again, she administered anesthesia for the first total pneumonectomy. Um, she collaborated with um, Richard von Forgo, and she wanted to develop this anesthesia machine that would help regulate. Instead of doing the op open drop ether, she said, we need an anesthesia machine that we can turn the dial and say how much inhaled gas we're giving. And so she worked with, and there are, you know, the von Forger machines, anesthesia machines out there. They wanted to name it the Lamb anesthesia machine, and she said, no, call it the Barnes anesthesia machine. Um, and so she, she gave a lot of input to this um, person who was developing this machine. And we can now turn on and inhale gases and regulate them with just a dial. Um, so she um, designed the Barnes Hospital School of Anesthesia pin. She gave this to all of her students. And I don't know how good you can see it, but there's three lambs jumping over. And you know we always talk about anesthesia and sleep and counting sheep and, and her name was Helen Lamb. And so she, she designed this pin and each student got this. Um, so the ANA established the Helen Lamb Outstanding Educator Award in 1980 when she passed away in 1979. And so um, I was fortunate to get that award last year which meant the world to me knowing that she started her profession at Barnes Hospital. Uh, and so uh, the Barnes School of Nursing Anesthesia was founded, like I said, in 1929 by, by Helen Lamb. She stayed there till 1951. Um, at some point, she married Walter Powell, and um, he was a, a trainer for the Olympic skating team. So Helen and Walter went ice skating at Steinberg Rink routinely. Um, he was going. He was serving as coach and he was traveling with the team and they had a plane crash and unfortunately he died. And so in his honor, the Powell Symphony Hall was going downhill and they were threatening to close it and she donated a million dollars and now it's called the Powell Symphony Hall in her, in her husband's honor. So, and there is a plaque of Walter Powell in the Powell Symphony Hall. So when we're there for graduation in December, we can see that. Um, so she served as the director, like I said, till 1951. Um, in Octo on October 1st, 1983, this Barnes Jewish Hospital nurse anesthesia program then moved to 
Washington University School of Medicine. So when I graduated from this certificate program in 94, I received a certificate from WashU School of Medicine, um, Department of Anesthesiology. Um, and so that closed in 1994 because at that time the ANA said that, um, that graduates must receive a master's degree. And um, WashU at the time did not have a school of nursing. And so it was closed and then um, now it requires a doctorate degree. So the director since that, Helen Lamb was 1929 to 1951. Dean Hayden, one of her, one of her students took over from 1951 to 1978. Helen Ogo then became the director from 1978 to 1983. Um, my program director, Laverne Joy Will, um, filled that spot from 1983 to 1994. It closed for 10 years, and then I restarted the program at Barnes Jewish College. So um, that's the program that we have now. So I'm very excited about it. And we have a great relationship wa with Washington University Anesthesia Department. And then just to also add to that, um, I talked a little bit about Douglas Eastwood becoming the chair of the anesthesiology department. So Helen Lamb was the chief CRNA, but she was also training and she was giving anesthesia um, for Dr. Grams. And so Douglas Eastwood became the chair of the anesthesiology department from 1950 to 1953. And then when he quit, they didn't fill that position for several years. They were looking for somebody. 1956 to 1968, Robert Dodd became the chief of anesthesiology and then moved to the Washington University School of Medicine. And just for a fun fact, in 1957, Barnes had 12 CRNAs, 33 SRNAs, and two anesthesiologists. Now we have much, much more <laughs> in students and in CRNAs and in anesthesiologists. Um, 1971 to 1980, C.R. Stevens, became the first head of the Department of Anesthesiology at WashU. We, every year, have a C.R. Stevens lecture that's offered by the anesthesia department. And um, it's always a well-known speaker that comes in and gives a great presentation. Uh, in 1980 to 1982, Leonard Fabian um, was the acting head of anesthesiologists. 1982 to 1992 was William Owens, and I became a CRNA at the, in the department at that time, so Dr. Owens was, was my chair at the time. 1992 to 2019 was Dr. Alex Evers, and then Michael Avedon became the chair in 2019, and he's serving as our present chair, so, so just a little bit of history. So um, another interesting fact I heard from one of the surgeons, Dr. Moon, who gave a talk on, on the history of Barnes, said that the Surgeons, you know, they're usually assigned a group of ORs that they always operate in, and they had to decorate them, them themselves. So this is a picture in the 1920s of an OR at Barnes that was painted, and you know, it was the surgeon who designed this. And if anybody's been here a long time, room eight, nine, and ten were the neural ORs, which is now room 231, 232. Um, at Barnes, it's that same hallway, but I remember that hallway, but this is earlier than my time, I do have to say, <laughs> so. Um, so we've come a long way. Like I said, initially, you know, the anesthesia was whiskey, or it was maybe somebody found some morphine, and the surgeons worked very fast, um, and we've come a long way since then. We, st you know, we discovered inhaled anesthetics, um, and so just a little bit of history, you know, initially they didn't give it oxygen. They, they, then they realized, okay, people are dying from infections or they're dying from hypoxia, and they started adding oxygen. Um, the oxygen mask was developed in 1972, endotracheal tube 1920, if you remember, um, Helen Land came in, in 1927 and started using it. Um, Circle anesthesia breathing circuits that we used in the OR were developed in 1930. We started um, collecting and measuring end tidal um, carbon dioxide. Thiopento, which I got the opportunity to use, was an induction agent in 1934. Lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic, came shortly after. I think everybody knows propofol, which is the Michael Jackson drug. Um, <laughs> It should be given by an anesthesia provider and not by a cardiologist, but it was developed in 1989. 
1990 Pofax symmetry. So we didn't, we had to look at, they had to look at the color of the skin to see does the patient look hypoxic, is it dropping um, saturation. So that was a huge discovery. Um, 1996, entitled CO2, 1982, transesophageal echo was applied. Um, in 1996, brain function monitors. So we now give propofol anesthesia and we put brain function monitors on them to try to help determine how deep the patient is. So we've come a long way and I have a picture of what our ORs actually look like now. You can see there's tons of technology behind us, lots of machines, lots of noises, lots of beeping. And um, what the person is wearing is that vest monitor that shows how deep the anesthetic is. And we use that routinely when we give uh, propofol anesthesia. So um, we've come a long way, but we've come even further and Michael's gonna talk about that. So he's also gonna talk about general anesthesia in general. But. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Clark, for the really gracious and warm introduction. It meant a lot to Dr. Henricks and me. I'm so happy to share a platform with you, um, Dr. Henricks. Um, Bernadette and I have been partners in crime um, for 23 years, and we've done a lot, a lot together. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. Um, these are thanks to um, many funding agencies that have supported the work that we've done over the years. And I want to say unambiguously that all of the research that we've done has been with um, partnership with CRNAs and SRNAs at, uh, from the Goldfarb School of Nursing and Washington University. Um, School of Medicine. I also want to point out that we have had grants from the National Institute of Nursing Research, of which I am very proud. Um, I will also mention that my start in research uh, was from the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital, and I will refer to the work that we did that was originally funded from that. I see Brian in the audience, and poor Brian's going to be mentioned several times in this talk. Brian being b um, the um, associate director of the um, SRNA um, program at Goldfarb School of Nursing. So um, in about 2012, well, anesthesia, general anesthesia has been around for 175 years. And Atul Gawande in the New England Journal of Medicine said that general anesthesia has been the most important advance, advancement in medical history because it was transformative in terms of what it allowed. This slide just tries to give you a very brief overview of what is possible with general anesthesia and all of these areas from different types of adult pediatric surgery, psychiatry, interventional um, radiology, medicine, super specialty surgeries, critical care, pain management, none of this would be possible without advances in general anesthesia. So this has been f foundationally important to the successes that we've had. I'm going to just tell you about some of the amazing work that we have done. I'm also going to share some anecdotes. Some of them are a bit naughty. So um, be, be ready for that. I, where, where's Dr. Martin? Um, I, I had in mind something, Jackie, that I'll you know, share with you. And we, Dr. Martin was talking about the market today. And I'll show you something. So remember, I'm tantalizing you like <laughs> King Tantalus, something to do with the stock market, <laughs> which is really interesting. So what is general anesthesia? General anesthesia is pretty magical. It is amazing that we can completely remove consciousness such that there is no perception and that it is done safely and that we restore consciousness. General anesthesia is not sleep and calling it sleep is a misnomer. When you sleep, when you sleep, you are aware when you wake up that time has passed. 
a profound difference with general anesthesia is that when you undergo general anesthesia and you emerge, you have no knowledge, no feeling that time has passed. It is a profoundly different neurological state. And it is remarkable that we've managed to accomplish that pharmacologically. So most people who have general anesthesia go this great pathway. They have their general anesthetic, they're unconscious, they're immobile, they're physiologically stable, they um, wake up, they emerge, they very quickly become compass mentis, lucid, all is well, and then before you know it, they're back at work um, and they are back to being CRNAs, like Bernadette. However, there are problems that occur with general anesthesia, and some of the work that we have done at Washington University and at, as, as members of Goldfarb School of Nursing have made incredible contributions internationally, and I'm just going to show you a couple of those, recognizing that we're limited for time. So um, intraoperative awareness continues to be one of the most feared complications for patients who undergo general anesthesia. And we know this because we continue to survey patients and they keep saying that they are worried about waking up with the sensation that they are like be akin to being buried alive is the best way to describe that. That you are unable to move, you're unable to communicate, and you have this most incredible suffering. And I'll show you one um, report from a particular person named Donna who, who suffered from this complication and has allowed me to share this. So I, I don't know if people get the mythological um, allusion here, but we've got Charybdis and Scylla, Scylla being on the cliffs and Charybdis being the whirlpool. And there were various um, times in Greek mythology where one had to navigate twixt Scylla and Charybdis, like Jason and the Argonauts or Odysseus. And um, you know, usually they lost a few sailors in, in the process. They never got away unscathed. Um, if you've got into Charybdis, you were finished, but Scylla would just eat a few of the sailors, so <laughs> he's probably got through okay. Um, and the problem with general anesthesia is you're trying to navigate these narrow waters where you don't want to administer an insufficient amount, but you also don't want to administer too much. Now, here's where things get a bit spicy. Um, in the 1990s, there was this company called Aspect Medical. And I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to be mean to them because they were mean to me. <laughs> it's true. I'll tell you a bit about that, actually. It's pretty funny. Uh, well, they came up with this monitor. And they said that if you put this monitor on a patient's forehead, you could read their brain waves, and you could know for sure whether they were unconscious or conscious. Now, that's a bold claim, because the human mind is complicated. And even the simple act of distinguishing consciousness from unconsciousness is not trivial, is not trivial. Many people who look like they could be unconscious are conscious and vice versa. So they actually said, if you conduct anesthesia without using our monitor, you are negligent and, um, and, and you will be um, in medico legal jeopardy. And they actually sponsored one big trial that showed that patients who had this monitor had decreased awareness. And there was an incredible strong push to, to implement this across the board. So people like Bernadette, Brian, and I, and others, young whippersnappers at the time, um, went to the Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation and said, you know, we're not sure we are buying this. So we wanted to do a trial to see, does this monitor really prevent this devastating complication of intraoperative awareness? And we were, we were pretty as green at the time. So that's for sure. And, you know, the Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation showed confidence and invested in us. And that was really wonderful. And I love that. I love the fact that the foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital invests in promising young investigators and gives us 
um, and give us a chance. So um, we did this big trial. It was 2,000 patients. And you know, this is rookies who thought, we can do this. I mean, amazing that we pulled it off. And we published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And what we found, interestingly, is that if we set an alarm that went off when the anesthetic vapor concentration, what we colloquially call the gas, but it's actually a vapor, dropped too low, that alert was just as good as this monitor that monitored the brain. And that was um, a, a very um, interesting result. Now, I'll also tell you at the time that there were multiple, multiple, mostly people in the anesthesia world, but people beyond, who had invested heavily in this company, Aspect Medical. This is where I said to Dr. Martin, I would, um, we would resonate here. So what happened is that Aspect Medical, this is true, it's so funny. This company was on a bull run in um, 2008. Um, and, and this was its stock price. This is the actual stock price. In one day, we published this article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the stock price of this company dropped by half. And a lot of, I, I received death threats. <laughs> and a lot of people were very, very unhappy with me, especially in this company. So I think that I remain persona non grata and public enemy number one. Of, of people in this particular company, which has now been bought serially by, by other companies. But there's something very important in research that we learn, and that's that one swallow doesn't make a summer, even if it's your own swallow, and this was our study. So we decided we needed to do a bigger study to see are these results reproducible, because reproducibility in science is incredibly important. So we got two large grants, one from the Foundation for Anesthesia Education and Research and um, one fr and from the ASA. Um, you can see, you know, that's, I don't know if you can recognize me in that, but I won't be offended if you say you're not there in that photograph because <laughs> I'll believe it. Uh, you can also see Brian in that photograph over there. So, uh, you know, Brian, put up your hand so people can see you. That was, this was a labor of love we did in, in three um, sites, Chicago, Manitoba, and St. Louis. And instead of um, 2,000 patients, we randomized 6,000. And again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this time, we actually showed that using this alert for the anesthetic concentration was actually better, better than the monitor for the brain. So that, and, and this is also challenging to practice because people were not routinely setting an alarm for a low anesthetic agent concentration. A very simple intervention, easy to implement, and also points to a challenge that when you discover something in science, implementing it is not that easy, and which brings us to the whole field of implementation science. So let me change gear. Oh, actually, before I do, I'm going to tell you something that will scare you. I'm sorry that I'm ending this little anecdote with something alarming. It turns out that unfortunately, although very few people have intraoperative awareness and remember it, we now estimate that one in 20 people during surgery do wake up. They just don't remember that they've woken up. So we still have a very interesting and big challenge. So just because you don't remember it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And that I, I wanted to put that out there because it shows you how we still have a lot of work to do. Switching gear, remember I was talking about Scylla and Charybdis. So we've talked a bit about Scylla. What about Charybdis? So Charybdis, that whirlpool that drags us down, that horrible monster um, named Charybdis. Well, the notion was that anesthesia, general anesthesia, is neurotoxic. There's that concern about it. I wasn't convinced, and I'm still not convinced, and now I think at least I have evidence for not being convinced. And you know, that's why I'm drinking my gin and tonic there, because I don't think that that's too neurotoxic either. <laughs> but let's talk about general anesthesia. Now, general, an I'm sorry, about delirium. 
Delirium is the orphan Annie problem of perioperative medicine because especially, and I, especially with older adults, older adults following surgery are at extremely high risk of suffering from this complication. We don't know why it happens, and when it happens, it's associated with bad outcomes, including mortality. And 25% of older surgical patients suffer from this complication. It's a constellation of neurological symptoms, problems with thinking, problems with um, our emotions, there's paranoia, there is problems with sleeping, consciousness attention. It is a really big problem, and we don't know why it occurs. But one of the hypotheses was that general anesthesia is contributory. We also know that patients who have delirium are likely to experience all sorts of other complications, including mortality. They also experience longer time in the intensive care unit, um, and um, long-term cognitive decline is more common in patients who have delirium after surgery. So we had a grant from the NIH to explore whether we could use the EEG to detect early when a patient was slipping into deep anesthesia. So now it's the Charybdis um, monster that we're focused on. And um, this is what the brain waves look like. And what I'm going to point out to you, I don't know if the pointer works, but it doesn't matter. You can see that in those orange waves, there are those flat epochs, the flat periods. Do you see those? Those flat periods don't occur. If I put a brain monitor on you right now, your brain will not flatline. Not ever, not even if you go to sleep. You will not flatline. So there's something about a flatlining brain that isn't right, okay? And it turns out that general anesthesia, when excessive, makes the brain flatline. And we thought maybe that's driving this problem of delirium. So again, in, com in, in partnership with CRNA colleagues and anesthesiologists and, and, and m hundreds of clinicians within our institution, we randomized um, 1,200 patients to try either to avoid this flatlining or where we wouldn't see what the brain waves were doing at all. This was published in JAMA in 2019. And interestingly, what we found is that this flat lining was associated with delirium, but avoiding it did not prevent delirium. So how do you interpret that? The interpretation is that people whose brains flatline easily during anesthesia have a vulnerable brain, but the anesthesia is not driving their confusion or their delirium after surgery. We've just repeated that trial again in four centers in Canada in patients having cardiac surgery found exactly the same finding. Again, very reassuring. So as a scientist, I get very reassured when you have reproducibility in science. Now, Bernadette said that this is the penultimate topic that I'm going to be addressing, which is our perioperative um, innovation suite and telemedicine. I think that this has tremendous potential for the future. This is um, an area of research that has received funding from the National Science Foundation, the AHRQ, the National Institute for Nursing Research. We have developed, um, so we were doing, developing machine learning predictive algorithms before anybody here had even heard of ChatGPT. We were doing this back in 2014, 2015. And what we were trying to do is to see, could we predict in real time which patients were at risk for perioperative complications like respiratory failure, kidney failure, mortality. And we developed these predictive algorithms which keep improving on themselves and where the data can be presented to clinicians, to CRNAs, to anesthesiologists in real time, potentially allowing them to change their management. 
We also developed something called an anesthesiology control tower, which allows us remotely to monitor operating rooms. This is something that Dr. Martin has been a great partner to us on, and um, allows us to look at what's going on in multiple operating rooms and can we improve the quality of care within those operating rooms. My vision, which I think Bernadette and others share, and I, I think, I hope Dr. Martin shares, is that you know, ultimately this is something that can be delivered more broadly across BJC as we look to how we advance care system-wide and not just in, in a single hospital. Um, we're looking at this both in the intraoperative period and in the recovery area where people are um, emerging from their surgery and their anesthesia. Again, that's um, a younger version of somebody who may or may not be me. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that to your judgment. This was our, an early version of our anesthesiology control tower. And the, the conceit here, or the notion, is that this is like an air traffic control tower, that you can be monitoring um, hundreds of, of planes concurrently. And by the way, the air traffic control um, system broke down in the UK yesterday. You saw that. It's, so I thought, oh, bad timing for this, <laughs> for this talk. But anyway, the notion is that just like monitoring all these planes concurrently, maybe we can monitor all of these patients concurrently and detect early who's going off trajectory. So I think that, that this is very powerful conceptually, and the way that this evolves will be very exciting. And we, we are the only ones in the United States and in the world who are exploring these options currently. And that's, that's what's exciting about what we do leading edge at Goldfarb School of Nursing and, and within our partnership. It is that, that leading edge that we are proud of, and we're proud that we expose our students to these new innovations. This is an example of a dashboard where you can see all of these operating rooms being monitored concurrently, and you can zoom in on individual patients where green shows organ systems where things are going fine, yellow where things are perhaps heading in the wrong direction, and red where you have a problem. So for example, this is the aorta, and um, in this patient, the blood pressure was heading in the wrong direction. Um, at the same time, from this anesthesiology control tower, you can monitor the electronic health record. And this became um, augmented with the introduction of EPIC uh, in the electronic health record. And also where you can see the physiological data from the patients in the OR. And aspirationally, we hope to have cameras. And certainly, we're doing this as a pilot in the recovery area where you can actually see how patients are doing in the recovery area. And this is an, a, 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 a photograph of an earlier iteration of our anesthesiology control tower. It actually looks much more high tech than that now. And there's an article that people can read about that. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm, I'm going to stop with the anesthesiology control tower. I'm going to bring things full circle. And I'm going to tell you about a major trial that we are leading today with the University of Michigan. So remember Bernadette said to you that there are two main types of, of anesthesia. There's the anesthesia derived from ether, and that dates back 175 years, where Morton um, first demonstrated that at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And then there's uh, dating back 50 years, so th that drug you inhale. There's another drug that you give into the vein called propofol, which is 50 years old. And they are very different drugs. And interestingly, although both of these techniques have been around for between 50 and 175 years, to this day, we have not done a rigorous comparison of one versus the other. We do not know which is better which results in an improved patient experience and improved patient recovery. And if you think about that, that is crazy. You know, we've had these drugs available for so long, and we haven't done a rigorous head-to-head -head comparison. So we received a grant um, 
within the last couple of years from PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, for $30 million. It's probably the biggest um, grant for a perioperative clinical trial. And we've completed our pilot of, of uh, sorry, 300 patients, and we're about to embark on a, on a trial across 20 sites in the United States with 12,500 patients. And of course, Brian and Bernadette are prominent investigators in this important research. And many of the sRNAs and CRNAs, we couldn't do it without the CRNAs for sure. And the sRNAs will play a major contributing role. So um, we will discover, and um, by the way, John Glenn, who discovered propofol, won a very prestigious award for that recently. It's, it's such a, a, a foundational contribution, the, and the same with the, with the discovery of ether. And the gaps in our knowledge that we will address are which of these drugs is better in terms of intraoperative awareness, how people wake up after surgery, their san sense of well-being, their pain after surgery, their ability to communicate, to go back to work. If Dr. Martin comes and has anesthesia, he, he wants to work. He, he told us that earlier. So he needs to be back at work the very next day, right, Angeline? He told us that. So that's important. These are important things. And the other in interesting thing is that we need to do research that matters to patients. And these are things that patients care about. And, and that is also something that I've become passionate about. Let us ask questions that patients actually care about. So, you know, a patient isn't going to ask, you know, something like, will my creatinine bump by 0.1 point in six months' time? A physician might ask that question, but a patient is going to be interested, will I be able to walk my dog tomorrow? Will I be able to take care of my kids? The questions that patients care about fundamentally. These are some people who've experienced general anesthesia and have had different experiences. So um, um, some of you may know, for example, Dr. Dacey, a very prominent neurosurgeon. He's allowed me to share his experience. He had a wonderful experience of general anesthesia taken care of by people in, in our department. And, and he said that, that um, the major role of an anesthesiologist or CRNA is to prevent the patient from having pain, anxiety, impaired function, disability, and to facilitate the safe completion of the surgical procedure. And he did incredibly well. On the other hand, you had this uh, person, Donna Penner, who um, was her um, anesthesia a clinician failed to recognize that the vapor ran out completely and she had um, the most debilitating intraoperative awareness that has left her with lifelong PTSD and an inability to function in life. And then we have Heidi Klosterman, um, Heidi, another amazing human being who donated her kidney to um, somebody whom she didn't even know um, so that they could have a new lease on life. And her experience of general anesthesia um, initially was bad, but the second time was really good. So trying to understand why does somebody have a good experience and then a bad experience? Everybody should be having the good experience. This is what our trial is going to look like with 12,500 patients actually across 20 centers. It was 12 where we'll be looking at quality of recovery, functional status, and how people